Thank you, Peter. Next, we're going to uh, hear from Beth Kozel, who's an instructor of pediatrics at St. Louis Children's in Washington University School of Medicine. She's, she's going to talk a bit about the, the challenges in a rare disease area with both the challenges and the incentives and disincentives for um, the entire community in that, in that regard to uh, want to share their data. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Beth Kozel. I am a pediatrician. I am a clinical geneticist. I am a researcher, and on most days I like to believe that I am an advocate for the families and patients that I take care of. Um, as was said, um, I don't have anything else to disclose. Um, I participate in research in a rare disease population. So the group and the families that I work with um, are individuals that have a syndrome called Williams syndrome. Um, Williams syndrome is a rare disease um, that occurs in approximately one to ten thousand, one in ten thousand individuals. Um, it is caused um, in this situation. It is a rare disease where the genetic mechanism of the disease is known. Um, it is caused by the deletion of twenty-six to twenty-eight genes on the seventh human chromosome. Um, and the characteristics of the um, individuals with this condition are well described. So they include um, characteristic facial features, as you'll see from the cute kiddos and adults here, um, significant cardiovascular anomalies, including stenosis of great vessels, hypertension, and as we're learning, also stiff vessels. Um, there's a characteristic neurocognitive profile with um, very decorated speech, very social activity, but with high anxiety, high um, and poor ability to um, have in-depth um, social interactions. Interestingly, the duplication in this area leads to speech delay and many, many autistic type features. Um, there is also failure, um, failure to gain weight in infancy, consequently leading to this being a presentation often for these individuals in childhood and why they are diagnosed. However, these individuals then go on to have a predisposition for obesity and diabetes. Um, and there are other endocrine abnormalities, including hypercalcemia, thyroid dysfunction. This constellation of features leads to a complicated health picture for these individuals. It also leads to the coming together of many different research groups and research interests that have interests in many of these different um, developmental, um, neurocognitive, cardiovascular, all of these different phenotypes. As I said, the molecular mechanism for how this disease is um, caused is known. However, there's significant variability in the disease that exists. So on the, my particular work is in the cardio cardiovascular effects um, of this condition. And what we know is that around 30% of individuals with Williams syndrome will have severe enough vascular disease requiring surgery in order to keep them alive. And sometimes um, even surgery isn't helpful in that regard. And 20% of the individuals will go and live their whole life with none of the vascular problems that are seen, even though the deletion in this area is basically the same deletion. Consequently, there are likely other effects, genetic and otherwise, that contribute to this variability. Now, as a clinical geneticist, I know that when we make a diagnosis of Williams syndrome, we sit down with a family and we give them um, a list like this um, of the things that might go wrong. And, and you can imagine, as a parent, um, that hearing a list um, 200 miles long of things that might happen to your child and not really having a roadmap as to where to go from there is a big challenge. Um, the goal would be to be able to use genomic information um, or environmental information to be able to give people individual information about their child. What are the things that this family, this child is going to have trouble with so that families can focus their interest, get to the right doctors and being taken care of in the right way. Um, um, the problem in doing some of those genomic studies in a rare disease is that the number of samples required to do these analyses are huge. So um, this is a statistical um, calculations put together to look at how many individuals are needed to look for an odds ratio of a particular effect based on a particular polymorphism. So what you can see um, are these numbers here. So if you have an odds ratio of 2.5, um, in order to get about 80 percent power to look at that, you need 250 to 300 individuals who have the phenotype and 250 to 300 of them who don't. Now, as you can imagine, if you have a relatively common condition, I could look in this room, I could stand on the corner, I could probably find 
that many people with hypertension um, while standing there in the course of an afternoon. I could probably stand on that corner, however, for the rest of my career um, and never obtain a number of people with Williams syndrome to meet these calculations. So what this leads, and what I have found as a relatively junior investigator going to meetings and listening to talks, is that people then collect um, multiple, um, their small group of individuals, and they attempt to do a study um, with the 50 to 100 people that they can find. They attempt to publish it, and they are met with, you don't have enough power to do this study, so they bow their heads, go back to the lab, and that's where the data sits. Uh, then another group has the same great idea to do this study. They look at their 50 to 100 people, are not allowed to publish it, and go back to their labs. And I've seen on multiple occasions the same projects being done again and again, sometimes leading to negative results, which are then done again and again. And that data never gets out there to benefit families or even to benefit additional investigators from not doing the same study again and again. So this then brings into the, the role of other groups and how they may work um, to help facilitate um, collaborations between investigators and how that can be helpful um, and sometimes not as helpful as we might hope. Um, so as I said, um, in the work that I do, I work with the Williams Syndrome Association and this is a family group um, that brings together families and other individuals who love people with Williams Syndrome. Um, it has information for families on how to take care of their kids and information for for teachers and people who want to work with them, but then also inc includes a registry that allows families who are interested in research to get involved and to directly interact with researchers. So the Williams Syndrome Association understands their role in facilitating research and decided to go to their researchers to try and help this collaboration of bringing together researchers that are interested, researchers that are doing these projects to see if we can't do a better job of collaborating our work together. So this is an example of the work that, um, of a letter that they put out to around 30 investigators known based on their publication records and their participation in um, family meetings um, where researchers come to interact with individuals with um, Williams syndrome, um, asking them what types of specimens they collected. So in, the, in their eyes, this was sort of a first pass at seeing what's out there, what do we even have? So the letter went out to around 30 um, individuals, like I said, who were known based on their publication records to have samples. Um, of those, 15 of them were returned, so we're busy. Um, of the 15 that were returned, um, nine of the people said, we have no samples. Uh, six of the individuals said, we have samples, but there are significant barriers to sharing. Um, of those six people, they each said that they had around 10 to 100 samples, um, and they did go on to cite some of the reasons that they felt were challenges to sharing those samples. Uh, but there were absolutely zero investigators who said, I yes, I have samples, and I would love to share them with you. So barriers to clinical data sharing. Some of them we've talked about already. Um, and most of the, th all of the individuals actually who cited the trouble with sharing the samples they had um, talked about discussions um, with problems in regarding consent and IRB. Now, like I said, these are rare diseases. Some of the investigators that are involved in these studies have been collecting samples for 30, 40 years. Some of these individuals were consented before the molecular diagnosis was even known. Certainly, there was no exome sequencing. Certainly, there were not the technologies available going back and getting these people to reconsent them and find them based on new technologies and new studies would be a significant challenge. In addition, um, there are questions of samples conducted years ago or collected years ago in someone who is a child and is now an adult. They obviously might want to have an opinion on how their samples are used. Um, and there are questions of taking this genomic information, putting it into a database, um, both from a genetics perspective and if you're giving phenotype data, especially when you have a small, tight community where individuals do know each other, um, are there potentials for identification? Other can, things that we have talked about a little bit are um, sort of closer to home in terms of academia, how we are getting credit um, for these sorts of things. Um, if it is going to require all of us to put our samples together in order to get one statistically significant um, 
paper together. Um, how are we going to get credit? How am I, as a junior investigator, going to get tenure um, based on my participation with my few samples? Um, a lot of the way that tenure decisions have been made in the past is you're either first author or your last author, or it doesn't really matter what happens in the middle. Um, in addition, some investigators who have been doing this for decades, a lot of their scientific clout and reputation comes from the fact that they are experts in the field, that they have accumulated hundreds of samples um, and have reputations and um, with the families and um, you know that's sort of who they are. If they let that go, um, they, their sort of clout in the community becomes different. Other barriers are more technical. So um, much, many of our samples are collected in um, family meetings. So the way that these family meetings work is um, there's a national meeting of the Williams Syndrome Association where every two years um, families from across the country and actually across the world come to a particular city. Um, there are scientific discussions for the families about um, what's changed in terms of the health care for their children. And the families use what is basically their summer vacation um, to come and learn more about the syndrome, but also to graciously donate part of their time to research or, um, um, situated to our research protocols. Um, so research is conducted often in hotel rooms um, and so we tend to try to use the least invasive methods to collect DNA on somebody's summer vacation, um, which often includes um, cheek swabs. So as anyone who has worked with this material knows, you don't get gobs of, inf of DNA. You also do not get renewable sources of DNA. Um, and so the samples are limiting in terms of p what people are able to share and ship out to somebody else. Um, again, as we've talked about it, um, often journals are not interested in publishing small cohorts of rare diseases. Um, and we're often, even in with using these um, group situations, not able to obtain the number of samples needed to put together a robust, statistically, um, group of samples. The other problem with using these family group situations is that often you will have six, seven, ten research groups conducting research at the same meeting, which means that the same 100 wonderful, willing volunteers are giving, having very dry mouths, um, giving DNA to multiple groups. So even if you and I decide to get together and collaborate our data um, and put it together, it is often not uncommon that we have many of the same people together. You don't want to find out that your person number 137 and my person 276 are the same person after you've spent thousands of dollars ex home sequencing their data or their DNA. So what can be done? Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for things to be done. Um, I think a lot of it in, is going to involve changes. Um, like I said, most of the researchers talked about um, regulatory sorts of things. So can IRBs be changed in a way to allow dynamic conversation to occur between families? So like I said, the Williams Syndrome Association uses a registry, which is an online um, form where you, there are the possibility of dialogues where an email can be sent to families saying, there are changes to the protocol. Can you take a look at it? Do you want to see if you want to continue on with this? Now, having worked in collaborative research where we have had to use um, IRBs at multiple institutions together, um, that is an incredible challenge. What's OK at one institution may not be OK at another. Um, and certainly with these newer technologies, that becomes um, a bigger challenge. But I do think using social media um, and using these things for families um, and um, the researchers to continue to talk over time um, only leads to better um, acquisition of data over time. Again, we talked about the what happens when you actually finally get enough people to come together to put their samples um, together to come up with oops, um, an exciting publication is that you get your 1,000 medulloblastoma samples, and then you get an author list that is so big it doesn't fit on the paper. Um, what is your um, academic institution going to do with your being author number 77 on a list of 173 um, in terms of what that work means um, for your um, academic progress? Um, and so there need to be changes, and there are changes going on at promotion meetings, um, institutions at this time, but it's sort of just a new data, a new set of, of rules that are going to have to happen um, in academia itself. 
Funding organizations, um, it is my opinion that funding organizations um, should work to expand um, biobanks and those sorts of things for rare diseases. Um, they are things that can be spearheaded by individual rare disease groups, but many rare disease groups do not have the financial structure to put something together. In the end, I think that because of this um, repetition of the same data over and over again, ultimately science will be pushed forward by having that, um, all of that data in one place, um, but it's going to require infrastructure to do that. I also think that when samples are limiting, we need to consider not just biobanks that can send out samples, but potentially doing all of the genomics up front, having the data then available that can then go back and be mined. In these sorts of situations, people will have to do their own phenotyping themselves, but still being able to go directly to the genomic data, um, potentially using unique identifiers that can be identified by multiple groups and then studied are, is going to be the way to go in rare diseases. And then I think a lot of it comes back to what families can do. I mean, in general, this, you know, this is our careers that are taking place, but in general, what we're doing is for the benefit of, um, of the families that we care for. And so what can families do? I think what family groups can educate their members on the pros and cons of data sharing. I think in general, um, individuals who have rare diseases are willing to give up a little bit more in terms of privacy um, than potentially individuals with hypertension or other things because of the complexity of their disease, because of the severity of their disease and what finding a treatment means to them. We should talk to them about um, having individual members talk to their researchers about are you sharing. Um, all of us have seen a consent document that is 15 pages long, no one reads it, they sign it at the end, but at least talking to individuals about talking to the researchers, so are you going to share my data? Who else is going to be able to look at this so that more can be learned from it? At least if there is that discussion going on and researchers are aware that the individuals um, giving their time to the study want the data shared, um, may put more impetus on, fam on the researchers to make it happen. Again, creating um, databases with unique identifiers will be helpful. Um, journals um, should continue to require open access um, or accessible data, um, and it may also be possible to connect individuals with underpowered research um, so that data can finally get into it um, versus allowing publication of data that maybe isn't fully powered so that individual groups can put their data together. Um, again, it doesn't serve a, our rare disease community or science itself for all of this data to be sitting in people's drawers. So in summary, I think the development of personalized medicine strategies for rare diseases is going to require large data sets. Um, that's going to require coordinated efforts in multiple groups. Um, and there's likely going to need to be changes on all sides in order to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much.